I'm Grant Oliphant, and this is We Can Be. My journey really started with the photograph that was taken by Fimbo O'Reilly. His story covering the day that four of us were wounded. They're the only reason I could remember the worst day of my life. Those photos helped me come to terms with my own experiences and they helped me find closure in my own injuries. One day when I was in therapy, uh, my therapist handed me a notebook and told me to write. That notebook turned into a letter to Finbar thanking him for his photos. Uh, and then that wound up getting published with the New York Times and showed the world what his photographs did for me and my Marines. As the final U.S. evacuation flight left Afghanistan just after midnight on August 31st, 2021, many Americans felt relief that the nearly 20-year war was over, while also feeling deep sorrow for those Afghans who wanted to leave but could not. I'm one of those who believes that Americans have a lot of soul-searching to do about our relationship with wars that we cannot define the end of, and about our relationship with vets as they come home from the conflicts that we have sent them to. But for now, I want to focus on the fact that there is always more to the story of war than we realize, and today's guest knows firsthand just how true that is. Thomas Brennan is founder and executive director of The War Horse, a nonprofit newsroom that has gained international respect for reporting on the often unspoken human impacts of military service. A former Marine Corps sergeant who served as an infantryman in Iraq and Afghanistan, Thomas first gained widespread acclaim for a series of self-penned pieces in the New York Times that chronicled what he has called the mental health and moral injury caused by an attack in Afghanistan's Helmand province when he was 24. Founded in 2016, the War Horse won the prestigious Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Journalism Award in 2021 for its resolute reporting on sexual assault in the military. Thomas is co-author of Shooting Ghosts, a U.S. Marine, a combat photographer, and their journey back from war, a book he co-wrote with combat photographer Finbar O'Reilly. And he has guided the Warhorse in publishing investigative pieces that have served as catalysts for significant national policy change. Thomas, I'm delighted to be here with you today. Thank you for making the time. Oh, thank you for having me. Same here. You're coming off of what can only be characterized as a fantastic few months with the Warhorse gaining national awards, increased visibility that is bringing what you've called your quote, bulletproof reporting on the human impact of military service to even more eyes and ears. I love that phrase, by the way. I think it's a fantastic way of describing what you do. But let's hear it from you. How do you describe what the War Horse does and who you're hoping to reach? Why you even started this? I think at our core, the War Horse strives to be the pro public of military news and really fill a void and address the decline in military reporting that has been occurring across our country. Our mission is to serve as one, the, the most trusted newsroom for military reporting with the purpose of holding power to account and strengthening our democracy along the way. As a veteran, I see us as the necessary voice for veterans and military families. You know, it's interesting to hear you say the statement about a void in military reporting, because probably most people who aren't following this issue aren't thinking that there has been a void, that there's something that's missing. Can you say a little bit more about what you think that is? In recent years, the military has just been absolutely decimated and the industry has decreased their investment in military reporting. Over the course of 2020, Military Times had to cut a good chunk of their staff. The Atlantic divested Defense One and you've had the New York Times go ahead and close their at war blog which is where I got my start as both a writer and as a journalist. Mm. So, so the problem is, is absolutely growing worse. You know, we need muscular journalism to defend our democracy. And what a lot of people don't realize is that today the U.S. government spends nearly $1 trillion on defense and veteran affairs. 
And that's more than twice what it spends on healthcare, education, infrastructure, and diplomacy combined. To compare that to the state of journalism, less than 5% of all reporting focuses on military service. So there's a huge disparity in what exists out there, and journalism has to do a better job of bringing these issues to light. You know, 20 plus years of military conflict that the United States has been engaged in in Afghanistan, even though it's winding down, the amount of spending that's happening in society for military and veterans affairs, which you just mentioned. How is it possible that our media aren't providing coverage and in fact are cutting coverage at this time? I firmly believe it's because military reporting is incredibly difficult and it takes a dedication to being willing to navigate the Defense Department, which has a very strong track record for not being transparent and making it as difficult as possible for reporters to unearth the truth. Mm -hmm. I have equal difficulty writing a positive story about the Department of Defense as I do writing a negative story about the Department of Defense. Ultimately, that's something that jeopardizes their recruiting goals, which jeopardizes our national security. It's something that's always perplexed me as to why they don't better engage with the media since it's essential to achieving their mission, or it's a means to an end to achieve their mission. There's a deliberate effort to widen the military and civilian divide because then there's less eyeballs on the wrongdoing and there's less scrutiny on the programs and they don't like headlines. If they could be out of the headlines, it's a good thing. That's a provocative statement and I really want to come back to it. The idea that there's a deliberate effort to widen the civilian military divide is an important concept for us to struggle with in this conversation. But let's start with how you come by that. I mean, your journey to founding the War Horse began with your own military service. How did you come to choose the military and specifically the Marine Corps? I first thought of the military after 9-11. I knew that I wasn't ready for college. I was a mediocre high school student who didn't know what they wanted to do with their life. But one thing was certain, like I knew I didn't want to live at my home at home with my parents and stick to a minimum wage job. You know, my grandfather had always talked about serving in the Navy during World War II and how he wanted to be a Marine, but they told him he was too skinny, that he'd never be able to carry a machine gun. So there was had always been a seed in my mind as to whether or not like I could be a Marine. Mm. And as soon as 9-11 happened and I started to think about where I wanted to head my life, I went and, you know, walked through the recruiting office. And one of the first words that came out of the Marine recruiter's mouth was that, you know, I was fat and I couldn't do it. Um, (laughs) So, uh, and ultimately, like, I wanted to prove him wrong and, you know, And thus begins the process. Yes, and and thus begins the process. And and how many years were you in the Marine Corps, and how many deployments did you have during that time? Uh, So I did just shy of 10 years. I served in Fallujah during Phantom Fury in 2004 in Iraq. And then I did effectively a booze cruise with the Navy for another my second deployment. And then the, the, my third deployment was to Helmand Province, Afghanistan. And that's where I got injured and it ultimately led to my medical retirement. Is it hard to talk about that, by the way? It's gotten easier with time. The best advice that I ever got when I was first transitioning out of the military I received while I was writing profiles on World War II veterans while I was working at a a local newsroom in North Carolina, fresh out of the Marine Corps. And all of their advice was the same. You're not going to get over what you've been through. It's always going to be with you. Find a way to keep on moving or else you're a target. And, you know, coming from the infantry, like if you stand still, you make yourself an easy target. So that's why you keep moving. And they were saying that that holds true for adjusting to civilian life. And I have found that, you know, just keeping to move forward and being willing to have that conversation has helped me accept that it's a part of my life and that it's not going away. The reason I raised the question is that I think in the best tradition of military reporting, I want to make it clear that you come from that background, that you have exposure and personal experience in what you're talking about. You first started writing about war through letters home to your wife when you were deployed in a remote village in Helmand Province, which you just referenced. At what point did you recognize that you had a skill in communicating the intricacies of what you were seeing, military, service, and war? The seed was initially planted when I saw my first byline. Probably six months after I came home, I was still in the military, 
and I wrote a thank you letter to the journalist that photographed the day that myself and three of my Marines were wounded, and you know, he'd written about us in the past, and those pictures are a window into a day that you know, has really been wiped from my mind, so I wanted to write him a thank you letter. And I still, to this day, am horrible with grammar, <laughs> a big reason why we have copy editing <laughs> at the newsroom, and I didn't know anybody in writing. So I sent my letter to his editor at the New York Times, and I said, hey, I'm writing Finbar this letter. Could you please just make sure I got commas in the right place? Like, I don't mind if it's not perfect, but I, you know, I don't want to look like a dumb grunt. Um, to right, a professional right. dumb. And to my surprise, like, I don't know, now, later that day, he wrote back and was like, can we please publish this? Immediately after that published, aside from the reaction from Finbar, my Marines that I'd served with, service members I didn't serve with, family members of people who had served of all generations, civilians who didn't understand a damn thing about the military were all of a sudden connecting with this story. And that's the first time that I was like, huh, everybody is coming together in this conversation and everybody is listening here. You know, I think it's important, Thomas, if you don't mind, the genesis of the story that you just were sharing goes back to November 2010, when you were injured by a rocket-propelled grenade, for us to at least share some element of that story with our listeners. And I'm wondering if you would share as much as you feel comfortable sharing what happened that day and in the months that followed. On November 1st, 2010, I was a sergeant squad leader in the Marine Corps, serving in a remote place called Musakala, Afghanistan. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I had a squad of 12 Marines and a a corpsman, a medic, effectively. We lived on this remote outpost that was probably the size of two tennis courts. And the, you know, closest reinforcements to us were 30, 45 minute vehicle drive. At one point, we were the uh, northernmost position for Marines in all of Afghanistan. To say that we were in the middle of nowhere was an understatement. We left for patrol that day. Within a few hours, found ourselves uh, surrounded, or uh, U-shaped ambush, so enemy on three sides of us, ranged from machine guns to rocket propel grenades. My squad did exactly what a Marine squad does and, and, uh, you know, moved in on the enemy. During the course of that, I was hit. Myself and John Chun, who was one of my Marines, were standing against the wall, uh, getting ready to move, and one of the Afghan National Police, who was assigned to us, shot an RPG that that blew up within 10 feet of us and knocked us unconscious. At the same time, two of my other Marines uh, were hit by an enemy uh, RPG that that also gave uh, them brain injuries as well. So the, the four of us wound up having to be medically evacuated that day. I don't remember much else from it, uh, aside from, I remember vomiting into my Kevlar at, at one point. Yeah, uh, m- m- I, m- mostly I remember of things because of the photos that, that, that right. were taken that day, but uh, we were combat and effective that afternoon. I'm incredibly proud of my Marines for doing their job and picking up the mission when I was wounded, just like they were trained to do. But one of my most vivid memories from that day, aside from that, you know, what I think is valor uh, and heroism, is Finbar helping me walk to my medevac to have a journalist put down their camera and to help me and my Marines, uh, you know, get to safety. That that was a truly humbling moment for me that that has never really left my mind. Yeah. And it's always been an inspiration for me as a journalist, too, to kind of deliver at that caliber. Like, I've been very fortunate throughout my career to have some of the best mentors in the industry. And, you know, trying to pay it forward with those opportunities and that access is is huge to me. It's an incredible image, actually, to think about a journalist, like you said, putting down his camera and and assisting you in that way. You didn't medically retire from the military until 2012. You've joked about how you, or maybe not joked, about how you self-medicated your brain injury symptoms for a long period of time with tobacco and Starbucks coffee. At at what point did you realize that wasn't enough and you needed more help? 
I treated my migraines by you know, putting one or two packets of instant Starbucks into my lip like I was chewing tobacco. At its core, like I was treating my migraine with an insane dose of caffeine. Like I just thought I was stressed, getting headaches. Uh, you know, like I, I had just gotten blown up. My doctors told me everything would resolve. You know, in, in fairness to them, was I fully transparent with my symptoms in the beginning? No, not really. Mostly because I bought into like that they would go away. So, but I started recognizing within, I mean, weeks, I, I didn't know how to tell my guys, but I was stepping back from my roles in a way where when I would send them to go do security at the school that we had started, I wouldn't go on patrol with them deep down. Why? I was compromised. I was jeopardizing their safety. In reality, what did I blame it on? I blamed it on I had this logistic report to do, or I had to enter this data into you know whatever form the Marine Corps needed that week. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I found reasons not to do my job, and then when I got home, I felt guilty for a lot of that because looking back on it in hindsight, I wouldn't have been there to protect them. Like I wouldn't have been there to help them if they needed it, and then. Six months later, after I'd come home, I'd went out drinking with a few of my friends and my wife. And at the end of the night, I found myself like sitting in my car, begging her to take me to go buy a shotgun so I could go kill myself. And that was really a point where she was like, put aside the macho Marine mentality, you know, because you're not going to be able to be that macho Marine if you blow your head off. I mean, what? I don't I, I guess I kind of just resolved that my career would, I, I didn't know how it would affect me, but when I asked for help, I kind of resolved that I knew my career was going to be over, or at least it was going to be different in a monumental way. And it was. You were medically retired in 2012 with the Purple Heart, so you were recognized for the injury. And how would you describe what happened next? I think that asking for help paired with the fact that it took me so long to do so was why my military career was ruined. There absolutely is a culture of, you know, suck it up and keep fighting and weakness in asking for help. The first Marines that I went to and told them like, hey, I'm going to go do this. One fought in Fallujah. The other, I mean, he was a badass. Like, I can't remember where exactly he served, but, you know, he had done his time as an infantryman before. And both of them were like, go for it. You need it. You've done your time. Like you've seen your shit. And then, you know, later on that day when it made its way through the chain of command, that's when somebody, you know, in front of the unit said that there was this bitch ass sergeant that was, you know, asking for help or whatever. And, you know, from the moment I asked for help, like as much as I hate to admit it, like you are a cog in the machine as an infantryman, like you are a piece of gear. You are a means to an end. Like, and if you can't perform the mission, then you're dead weight. I was kind of taken from where I was in a leadership position, just given the best performance review that I had ever gotten my entire career. And then thrown in this unit with these two leaders who did nothing but try to make my life a living hell and tell me that I was full of shit. They destroyed my love for the Marine Corps for a few years. Like single-handedly, those leaders destroyed my love for the Marine Corps. Those two drove me to wanting to kill myself the day of my, or trying to kill myself the day of my retirement. And it took me a long time to lose that resentment. Being treated that way, yeah, it, it, it definitely ended my career, both through my own decision and not wanting to move forward with it anymore. And then also through you know other people having their hand in the cookie jar. In fairness to them, I waited way too long to ask for help. They're the overwhelming majority uh, of, of the responsibility for how I was treated because it was the Marines who did it. But I definitely carry some of the weight in that I didn't ask for help earlier. Yeah. When you're critical of the military, you're doing it from the perspective of somebody who believes in the role of the military and, and, and of the importance of, of the military being as good as it possibly can be and living up to its real commitments and promises to its fighting men and women. You have a strong sense of justice that guides war horses reporting. At the same time, a journalism outlet has to balance that commitment to truth and justice with not appearing to be activist in a way where it's unfair. How have you tried to balance that in your work? 
So I have opinions on everything. Everybody does. Every journalist does. Any journalist that says they don't have an opinion is lying through their teeth. The challenge is making sure that your opinions do not show up in your reporting. It's looking at it from a reporting lens perspective and saying, what are the variety of perspectives that I can include in my work that you know help me prove whatever the findings are of my reporting? I always remind myself and I always tell fellow reporters is to work to disprove your own hypothesis, work to prove your source is wrong, work to prove the documents wrong that you found. And when you're doing that and when you've got a strong editorial backbone that's giving you that copy editing and that Kelly's an incredible editor that pulls a lot of opinion out of my work. My first drafts have it in there. It's natural, right. um, but it's rigorous editorial process and the fact checking and the legal review, like the journalism 101 stuff that some of the best newsrooms have moved away from. Warhorse tells the story of Ty Uh, who dreamed of a career as a Marine, but her dream turned into a nightmare after an evening with friends at a barracks party. She had more than a few drinks and friends got her to bed in her barracks. She woke up to find a sergeant on top of her removing her clothes. She wrote this handwritten account of that night. It's all dark and foggy in my head. I don't remember much. I could see his ugly smirk and that disgusting hot breath. He's the worst. Please, I said. But that's all I can say before it all became so dark. What they chronicle is a young woman taunted by coworkers and let down by commanders after three suicide attempts. As Brennan writes, her plan spiraled off course as she battled post-traumatic stress which only worsened when over and over she learned nobody cared. In 2020, you wrote and published a story titled Gag Orders, How Marine Corps Culture Silenced a Victim of Sexual Assault. Just recently, as I understand it, this same soldier was given a dishonorable discharge from the military, meaning that she will have no access to veteran health care, including mental health care, primarily because of her honesty. When you as a journalist encounter a situation like this, where you've actually been personally involved in telling a soldier's story and having that not result in the sort of change one would expect from the system, how does that affect you as a journalist? So I need to correct one thing. She's not getting a dishonorable discharge. She's getting a um, bad conduct discharge. You can't write a story and, and watch a story like that go through fact check about somebody being treated so poorly by the system and not be emotionally affected by it. It represents the broader issues throughout the entire military and in particular, like how sexual assault is treated. You know, what's different about the military justice system compared to the civilian justice system is that in a civilian justice system, when the judge says, this is my recommendation, this is what's going to happen. That's the recommendation. That's what happens. Because of the unique circumstances in the military, the chain of command does not need to follow the recommendations of the criminal, military criminal justice system. In the case of Corporal Tae U, the judge made the recommendation that her entire sentence be suspended and that she be afforded her benefits and, and receive an honorable discharge. The general said, no, she's getting a bad conduct discharge. And in doing so, She's not going to be eligible for her education benefits. She's not going to be eligible for mental health care. <laughs> the system worked how it was designed. The judge may say, suspend the case, but if the general wants to send a message as a deterrent for future behavior like this, he or she can. Just to be clear, the message in this case is what? Don't report? That might not be the intended message. But the message that this sends to lower enlisted and people struggling with mental health and people who've been sexually assaulted isn't listen to your leaders and all will be okay. It's if you buck the system and right. say anything that, that goes contrary to what we say, that we will destroy you because they have effectively destroyed this woman's life. And this connects with another aspect of military institutional behavior that you've written about. Again, in 2021, you wrote a piece about how the military covers up senior officer misconduct 
and that there is a code of silence. As you've written, it's not just with respect to sexual misconduct cases and accusations around that, but that really, in in general, the military's response to accusations of senior officer misconduct is to cover it up or to bury it. Growing scandal in the U.S. Marine Corps. The secret Marines United Facebook group had hundreds of Marines as members. Reportedly, thousands of photographs of naked female service members and veterans were shared on the page, where users made obscene comments. Within the past 24 hours alone, I've had former Marines harass me online and say and state that they are actively looking for explicit, explicit pictures of me. One of the former Marines who has been harassing me and has gone as far as saying he would even throw an active duty female Marine into a barrel of acid. The online activity was first posted by The War Horse, a nonprofit news organization run by a Marine veteran and Purple Heart recipient, Thomas Brennan. I am fairly confident in saying that my reporting about Marines United and how active duty and veteran Marines were treating women, in particular women Marines, on social media was not helpful to the Corps' efforts with increasing the number of women in the ranks. They don't want bad headlines, but I think that public affairs and journalists have a shared purpose. Like, we want to get the news right. They want us to get it right. So it's always bothered me why they don't take a more proactive approach to helping to get that right. You you mentioned the piece about lost trust and confidence being a statement that they use for why they fire senior officers. It's not transparent. One of my sources told me it forces people's minds to go to the darkest corner of the room. It's going to cause younger Marines or service members to be skeptical of their leadership. And ultimately, that hurts how mission capable a a unit is. Like, you need to trust your leadership. And, And that you know, scales with the military. And then when you have people that aren't trusting the institution or, you know, don't think that, you know, it's being transparent with them or the American public, I mean, it widens the military and civilian divide. Acknowledging that, you pointed out a couple of times that there's been a deliberate effort that you perceive to widen the divide between the military and civilians. So almost... The opposite of what you're trying to do, where you're trying to bridge the divide, you see an effort by leadership in the military to drive it further apart. Why would that be? And what do you think are the consequences for a democracy if it's successful? So do I think that the military is saying we are going to increase the military and civilian divide? Like, do I think that that is is the intended outcome of their actions? No. I think they're more selfish than that, and they just don't want the bad headlines. I see. They want, they want to be able to control the narrative. Now, I think that it's the behaviors and the actions that go into controlling that narrative that are harmful to our democracy. There are many reports out there that show that government secrecy is at its worst, like we're you know denying things under the Freedom of Information Act request at levels that we've never done in the past. There are less military reporters. There are less military reporting that exists. So I think that they're able to play into that control the narrative playbook a, a little bit more. And the fake news argument, you know, let's remove politics from it, just like the term fake news and the negativity toward the media at large and, and the fourth estate, I don't think has helped the outlook toward journalists and journalism. With that being said, like with there being less qualified military reporters in the space, it's also fair that the military be a bit more skeptical about the motives and you know the potential risks that can come from talking to people who don't have an expertise in this topic. You know, the issue around how journalism is viewed more broadly in our culture is a really critical aspect of this. You know, this the military component of it is just one face of how journalism in general is having to struggle to be taken seriously by people in, in, in power who can dismiss it with a phrase like fake news or who can just see it as, as not being up to snuff in whatever ways they, they want it to be. I think you're raising a really important question, a great example of one of the things that you do through the War Horse, which is to run no-tuition workshops for 
people in the military to learn how to become journalists uh, because you think it's really important for people with that background to get into the journalism game and be able to share the fruits of their experience. Do you think that that background will help with the broader civilian population's understanding of military issues? So the first story that I wrote for the New York Times, that was the inspiration for the first-person reflections that we teach people to write when they come through our writing seminars. You have a story to share that's worth telling and that's worth people reading. I'm writing about sexual assault. Ultimately, my goal is to empower other people and myself. I'm writing a story um, about experiencing my first mass casualty. And... Writing's given me freedom. It's the things that hold you back. I really want it to be something bigger than myself. What Thomas and what the War Horse are doing by giving this generation of veterans a voice and by actually educating people on the true cost of war is priceless. Hearing somebody's story in their own words, when done effectively, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is much more powerful than hearing somebody recite those words or spit them out in a different way. That's what we're investing in. Right. Veterans, military spouses will share their stories and it will help us not only bridge the military and civilian divide, but you know, forge an audience that will invest in the future of our newsroom. I'm wondering, you know, I hadn't planned to ask you this, but having served there, how is it for you watching what is unfolding now as the U.S. withdraws from Afghanistan? If you had asked me this question four or five days ago, I probably would have had a much different answer, and here's why. Up until five days ago, I thought that my interpreter was living near Virginia Beach and enjoying the American life as a citizen. Mm -hmm. I hadn't caught up with him in a while. Turns out that you know, he'd been waiting since 2016 for his wife's visa to be approved. And last year he was told that he hadn't lived with her recently enough since he filed his application for her to be eligible. So he moved back to Afghanistan in Kabul, where he's now actively being hunted by the Taliban. And he refuses to participate and be a part of President Biden's uh, evacuation plan because he feels like the U.S. is abandoning his wife. His family was all he talked about. He served as an interpreter because he believes in his country and he, believed, he wanted to provide better for his family. I'm proud to call him a fellow American, but to know that he's living there right now and making this decision is, is, is definitely tough for me. I have met so many veterans for whom their interpreter is one of the people that they feel closest to from their entire experience in Afghanistan. I was the senior guy. Like I worked through him. There were three times immediately, yeah, at least three times immediately come to mind where he pulled me aside and was like, that guy is a liar or, you know, that guy is this or this is, you know, he's speaking in this language or this dialect. That's like something is up. And we found like IEDs or we didn't like there were tangible differences that he made that I firmly believe may have saved our lives. And he did not graduate Paris Island. He did not earn the Eagle Globe and Anchor, you know, that, that makes you a Marine. But I told him before we left Afghanistan, like for all intents and purposes, like he is a fellow Marine to me. Mm -hmm. Like he went through it with us and he didn't have to. He could have stayed at university. And, right. and yeah. it's powerful. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Thank you for asking about him. It sucks. I love that dude. And I was so proud to, to meet him in America when, when he got his visa. And to like know that I can't be there and, and help him when I know exactly, like I've been on the receiving end of, of the fire that's coming his way. That sucks. And I know we're among countless other units that have the same thing going on. Well, I appreciate your candor about that. That exchange just illustrates for me how, uh, again, why you are the respected writer that you are. What's next for The War Horse? I mean, we're really excited as we continue to work through the pandemic. We're, we're looking at relaunching our writing seminar series. 
so the first three that we want to do beginning in 2022 are, are for Gold Star kids, children who lost a parent over in one of the post 9-11 wars. The second cohort we want to do is military spouses. And the third one that we want to do is for interpreters from Iraq and Afghanistan and pair them up with service members that they fought alongside. So we can kind of flip the script on translating and, and help them publish their stories. And hopefully mine will be back in America to participate. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Thomas, the, the name of our podcast is We Can Be. What do you think we as a community, country, and world can be? I think we can be better. We want a better world to live in, and we want it to be better for our kids than it was for us. I deeply appreciated Thomas's honesty about the reality of his experience and his instinct that sharing it could help others understand more clearly what we ask of those who serve our country. One thing that Thomas has said on other occasions is this, quote, when reading my reporting, I don't want people to think that it's poor me or woe is me because veterans don't want pity. We want to have a conversation. Creating the platform for that conversation has become Thomas's focus, and he's doing it with an honesty and a commitment to facts, no matter how uncomfortable they may be, that is needed at this moment more than ever. What the War Horse is doing is important because of the military-civilian divide in this country that often finds the general population believing that a well-intended thank you for your service is the entirety of our responsibility to our veterans and active duty personnel. Actually, our duty as citizens begins with asking the same sort of tough questions that Thomas and the Warhorse are asking. Thomas and the Warhorse team are bridging that military civilian divide through their commitment to impeccably researched journalism that tells unvarnished stories of what it really means to serve our country. As Thomas says, we aim to strengthen our democracy by improving our country's understanding of the true cost of military service. It is through these stories that show the full complexity of what it means to serve in our military that we can begin to understand the true value of our veterans and the freedom they fight for.